If you missed the last episode of Catalyst, go back and listen. If you're caught up, here's where we left off. And a warning, this episode contains sounds recorded during life-saving efforts in a Texas jail where an inmate died. Some listeners may find it disturbing. He called me from jail to let me know that he was arrested. And he told me what happened over the phone, and I was like, is everybody okay? Ouchie. You got to keep up you up, but I'm still going to try to leave a loose on you so you don't have to touch it, all right? Uh, You're actually being charged with intox assault. Intox assault? Yeah. What is that? It's when somebody gets injured by driving one type kids. He was like, Mom, I need you to try to find this girl that I was riding with because I pulled her out the wreck so she wouldn't drown. As a result of the crash, what kind of injuries have you sustained? I've been paralyzed from waist down. What were his injuries like? From what I seen, he had a busted eye vessel. He said his back and his shoulder and his legs was hurting from the impact. And he said, well, mama, my body started hurting. I told the officer, I'm sitting down because I'm hurting. And next thing you know, they had him in lockdown. And I just feel like you're not listening, you know? He said he was in pain. It's easy to look at the event and say, I wish we'd have done this differently, because obviously you have somebody who has passed in our care and custody. There was no one arrested or indicted. There were no suspects in Mr. Titus's death. That is correct. Why wasn't it prevented? Like, was this preventable? I want to know that. Sometimes it's not clear what should be released, and we rely on the county attorney's office to help us navigate those waters. Like, I gotta go the rest of my life not knowing what really happened to my kid, and I'm supposed to get over it, I'm supposed to move on. This is Texas Ranger Michael Smith. I'm at the Dale Valley Travis County Unit. The Texas Ranger who showed up at Demisha Burns' door a few days after her son died in jail had told her it was odd he wasn't notified immediately after the death to begin his investigation. I'm conducting an investigation into the questionable death of Mr. Herman Titus. It was one of the questions he wanted to ask as he continued his interviews. What I'm looking at is um, trying to figure out what happened with it. The ranger recorded all of those interviews and collected copies of the evidence Travis County had. Documents, video, audio, some of the same evidence the county denied Demisha and her attorney. In doing so, I'm going to be interviewing everybody that had any kind of contact with them within that period. Demisha's lawyer had dropped the case when he hit those roadblocks and never tried a backdoor way to get the evidence. Did he talk to you any? Requesting it from the Rangers, which worked for us. A little bit. I mean, uh, basically, we talked about was his mom and his sisters. I mean, he's 21 years old. He's talking about getting out. What we obtained helped us document the day Herman Titus died and might explain the delay the ranger described in notifying him. A lot was happening fast, according to jail staff and Herman's cellmates. What do you know about uh, Herman? What is it that you want to know? Well, when y'all were in the pod together, did he, was he uh, complaining about the injuries or anything like that? No, uh, I mean, he appeared sick the night before. He was up and down all night. He was in a rack. He was on the floor. Sick with his head down on the table. And when you say he appeared sick, was he vomiting? No, nah, he was like breathing heavy. So he was up and down out of the rack all night. There's also surveillance video showing Herman leave his cell overnight, stagger around the common area, and speak with a guard on duty. He then sits at a table and rests his head. Do you know if if he had complained about his head hurting or anything like that? I, I know that he was in pain because he, he went and laid down and had himself covered up and he was moaning and groaning and asking for ibuprofen. Um, and then he talked about, you know, uh, when he had originally got arrested, because uh, I believe it was intoxication assault, what he got arrested for, he was in a car wreck. You notify anybody about his condition? He went to medical the next morning and he pushed a button and asked to go to medical, so his fingertips was numb. Something else. I think he said he had a headache. Had a headache in his fingertips, which now when he went to medical. And he told the officer they needed to go uh, see a doctor. And then the officer said, "What's uh, what's wrong?" He says, "I can't." I, I he goes, "My fingertips are numb, and I feel like I'm gonna faint." Those were his words. That was the last time I heard him talk.
video also shows Herman handcuffed to a wheelchair taken by an officer to medical. Interviews with multiple officers and nurses confirm they were not only aware of his pain, but also knew he'd been in a major car wreck just weeks before. Could you tell me, I was told that you had some interaction with him. Could you tell me a little bit about that interaction, what you remember? I was the uh, program's clinic officer. Okay. Um, so that morning, I guess his building called and said he was in a, uh, he had a medical emergency. The doctor said to send him over. Um, he came in and went into the uh, waiting area as normal. Everybody that comes in goes into the waiting area in case they're contagious or vomiting or something of that nature. So as he was waiting to see a doctor, he just complained, said he was sore, said he felt sore, said his back and his neck hurt, that he was playing basketball the day before. He was brought over to the clinic where I was working. I spoke to him briefly. He said he was in a car accident, and he said he played basketball the day before and was sore, uh, neck, back, and tailbone. He was upset when he was brought in because he had to wait to be seen by medical. Um, he wanted to be seen immediately. He started yelling uh, toward the nurses, you need to see me right now. Why the fuck should I wait? Records say he was banging on the glass of the waiting room. He was yelling to be seen by medical, and then he asked if he was going to be charged by medical, and they told him yes, and the officers took him back to his building. A copy of the form shows Herman's signature, but the reason listed for his refusal is faded and difficult to read, and the portion that should be signed by both Herman and the medical provider is blank. That section is supposed to let the inmate know he's not only refusing medical treatment against the provider's advice, but that there could be possible risks for refusing. They said he signed a refusal form and didn't want to pay for the emergency visit. I took him back to Building 12. A jail price sheet says emergency assessments cost just $10. A spokesperson told us an inmate is never denied access to medical care based on their ability to pay. And if an inmate has a medical condition deemed to be an emergency and refuses care, EMS will be activated and the inmate will be taken to the hospital. Do you believe or do you know if any of the guards took their time or neglected him? Apparently, I mean, due to what happened, he probably shouldn't have came back for medical. As far as I'm concerned, they didn't do their job. And what, why would you say that? He came back for medical, it wasn't a half hour later, and he was dead. Do you think that the officers, the guards, or the medical staff was slow to react? It was, it was during the time we were laying down uh, asleep. And then the next thing you know, my cell is like, hey, man, this, this guy needs a doctor. And when I get up and look, he's over there, passed out in the corner. And, you know, it, it's just that if somebody says that their their fingertips are numb, I don't, I don't see why they didn't check. I don't know why whenever he went down, wherever he did, they didn't check him out. They didn't, you know, listen to his heart. You know, that, that, that has me baffled. Why didn't they? Ch I mean, that's a major sign when you say your fingertips are numb. You know, to me, that's already a sign of some kind of cardiovascular, you know, trouble. Okay, the time is approximately 9, 12 a.m. And now I'm here to talk about the, the death of a young man that occurred here about a week or so ago. And I was told that you you um, had some dealings with him, you treated him in some way? Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, there was a medical emergency call in building 12. The inmate was having a seizure. I responded with another nurse. Did you have any prognosis as to what caused the seizure? No. What kind of treatment did you give him? We respond. We have a medical bag with all our medical supplies, so we responded. I then left to retrieve medical information on him because we didn't know you know, we don't have anything there, so the provider wanted to know some medical history on him. So I left the cell to go to call to get medical information out of this chart from another nurse here. Did you do you remember the information that you got from his chart? Yes. Um, the nurse told me that he was in a vehicle accident before jail, was sent to the ER and was cleared, came to jail, um, had seen a provider like the next day, I think, or the day after, um, and was fine. Didn't okay. find anything wrong with them at that time. And I think that was like the last entry in his chart as far as medical complaints. Okay. Um, that was all that 
the little history that we had on them. Did you see anything that was that was out of, out of normal for you? Before we got there, we had no idea that he had stopped breathing and that CPR was in play. We didn't know that until we got into the cell. At what point in time would EMS have been called? They were, from what I understand, was already called. Okay, they were en route as far as you know? Yeah, as far as I know, I asked, so is, is um, 911 been called? I was told yes. When the guard came in there, he told us all to get out. When the medical team came in, the, they were starting to administer CPR on her. I just gave another round of epi. Okay. Sure, yeah. Still got nothing. Another video shows crews with Austin Travis County EMS and the Austin Fire Department working to revive Herman in his cell. It's crowded with medical equipment and several people packed into the small space. Herman is on his back on the floor. No shoes, no shirt, only wearing his black and white striped scrub pants. His arms are stretched out wide. His eyes are closed. The only movement comes as his body shakes with the compressions. 91, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Definitely getting harder to push. After about seven minutes on video, they stop CPR. 80. And call for a time of death. Okay, y'all. We're good. Thank you. Two minutes later, they realize he still has a pulse. Barely, but it's there. Hold on a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Get over here. She's calling you back. We have a pulse. Whoa! I'm not I am. Are you? I'm not getting anything here, are you? Oh crap, sure do. Alright, alright. Okay, okay, let's get a 12 lead on this. That might be a shockable rhythm. That's a shockable rhythm. That would be shockable. Okay, stand by. Keep doing CPR. Let me get a back on air. Hey, stand by. Stop CPR. Everybody clear, clear, clear. Shocking. CPR, CPR, get on the chest, get on the chest. Let's start over. Do you think that they were slow to react? You know, all I was just thinking is they, they had him there for a long time. I was just wondering why why didn't they get him out sooner or quicker? Or I don't know. You know, to me it seemed like it was slow. But like I said, I've never been in that situation before. i never seen that happen. You know, in my, in my opinion, I, I think that, that it was a slow response when the medical team came and all they were in there. I just thought, you know, you shouldn't even get this man to the hospital. Why isn't he going to the hospital? Here you go, here you go. All right. All right. Back forward, yeah. After resuming CPR, nearly seven more minutes pass before they get him strapped to a backboard and lifted onto a gurney. Okay, nice pulse check. We're going to pick him up. We're just going to roll him up that way. And 90. 100. Pulse check. You're in the oh. I can't feel pulse. Pulse? I got pulse? nothing. I'm not getting a pulse. Is it ready? Yep, ready. Yeah. All right. One, two, three. By then, his limbs are so stiff, they have trouble getting his arms through the doors as they make their way to the ambulance outside. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's walk him out. Trent's safe better than fast, okay? Yes. About as quick as we can get. Mills, you got gloves? All right, where are we going? Mark, that's awesome. They cuff his ankles as he's loaded in. That's the rattling you hear. And that's the last time we ever see Herman. When y'all can close that door. He's officially declared dead shortly after at the hospital. We asked EMS and the fire department about that last video, and their medical director launched a clinical investigation. No one was disciplined, but as a result of our questions, paramedics began training to use handheld ultrasound machines. They helped detect faint heartbeats that could otherwise be missed like what might have happened with Herman. But that was the very end of his emergency. Demisha was more concerned with what led up to her son's death. 
Remember, several interviews reference a basketball game he played in jail the day before he died. Some mention him saying he was sore. Other records also suggest a fight with another inmate. That alleged incident was caught on camera. On the other end of the rec yard, there's no sound. And the images are too far away and grainy to make out much when one inmate approaches someone who appears to be Herman. The ranger's investigation says Herman had no bruises or signs of physical harm. But the medical examiner felt it was important enough to list in the autopsy report that Herman had a medical history of having been possibly struck by another inmate in the face while in the recreational yard, after which he began to complain of arm and back pain, numbness of the hands, and generalized weakness. Still, the autopsy lists Herman's cause of death as hypertensive cardiovascular disease, that he had hardening of the walls inside of his heart, and heart disease due to high blood pressure. I just want to know what really killed him because it's kind of hard to accept that my son just died from natural causes. I should mention Herman's jail intake form does say he had a history of a heart murmur, but a medical provider also noted a regular heart rhythm and no murmur during his first clinic visit. He was a healthy kid. Demisha said it had never really been an issue. Healthy. He's passed every physical exam. He ain't never had a problem with anything in his life. Demisha thought about the advice she'd given Herman after he got out of prison, before the wreck, before he went back to jail. It was about choices and consequences. It was about responsibility. He had his whole life ahead of him. To her, Herman was facing up to what he'd done, preparing for court, getting ready for what might be next, but he didn't choose this outcome. There is no reason how a 21-year-old child should just be dead. It was something that stacked up, something beyond his control, something the criminal justice system had failed, a system Demisha knew herself. What hurts the most is that when I finally got life together, when I finally know how to live the way that I should have been living years ago, my baby not here to get this part of me. She'd been in jail in the past. She'd had her own addictions. And as a single teenage mother, she rose to her responsibility. I wanted him to see this part of mom, to see that mama did it. Mama changed, mama got it together. I mean, that boy had been with me through everything. You know, I mean, me and him, we raised each other. You know how many times my son picked me up off that floor? And I'm thinking, I'm too young to be a mom. I can't raise you right. That you'll probably do better in foster care. How many times that little boy said in my face to sit you're the best mom? I don't care what nobody else think about you. You're awesome to me. You do right by me, you know? And every time he told me that, it made me get up and want better for us. And I went out there and I did everything I could to change my life to give him better. This time, she felt she had a new responsibility, one she'd have to meet without Herman's help. Legal deadlines for a lawsuit had passed, and any chance for discipline seemed unlikely. But finally, armed with answers and anger, she was determined no family should ever go through not knowing in the future. He's not here. He can't enjoy this life with me. And I don't think it's right because he went through hell with me. So why don't he get to enjoy the good life with me? Three years after Herman's death, Travis County continues to withhold some information in his case. And it's part of the reason Texas leaders and people like Demisha are now pushing for greater police transparency at the state capitol. Next time. House Bill 147 closes a significant loophole in our public information law that's had tragic consequences for Texas families. Families like the ones you'll hear from today deserve to know what happened to their loved ones. 
Hello, my name is Demisha Burns, and I am for this bill. It's probably not gonna benefit me because doors has been slamming in my face throughout this whole process, but for someone else who happened to experience exactly what I'm going through, this bill being passed will help them because people deserve to know. We've created an immersive video feature to walk you through the evidence in this case, and a digital project to further explore police transparency problems across Texas online to accompany this podcast season. Just go to deadincustody.com. Catalyst is reported, produced, and edited by me, Josh Hinkle, along with David Barrere. Digital support for this episode comes from Andrew Choate, Stephanie Dockery, Arzo Dost, Rachel Garza, Matt Mitchell, Sarah Rafik, Christine Sanchez, Martin Sanchez, Robert Sims, Kate Winkle, and Corbin Wright. KXAN's news director is Chad Cross, and its vice president and general manager is Eric Glassberg. 